Well, this morning, if you will take your copy of the scriptures and turn to Judges chapter 16, that is going to be our text this morning as we continue our series, the, uh, the you know, community in chaos and God in control. I can't think of a more appropriate series to be going through at this time than this one right now. You know, sometimes when we look at the world, we wonder why people who have been given such amazing talents and gifts would squander them. If you follow baseball, you might wonder why those who have such amazing athletic uh, abilities, who have reached the pinnacle of, of their sport, would risk it all by taking performance-enhancing drugs or anabolic steroids. You know, if you think back to the early 2000s, one of the greatest players in baseball was Alex Rodriguez, uh, A-Rod, who played for the Yankees, and he was at the pinnacle of the game. He could uh, out-hit, he could out-run, he could out-play just about anybody who was on the diamond. And at that time, it just wasn't enough for him. He had more money than he could spend. He was guaranteed a spot in the Hall of Fame, And yet, he took steroids. Why? Well, I think that the columnist David Brooks explained it well. He he offered a warning that could apply to any one of us. He said, self-preoccupied people have trouble seeing that their talents come from outside themselves and can only be developed when directed towards something else outside themselves. Enclosed in self, they come to believe that their talents come from self and are for themselves. Locked in a cycle of insecurity and self-validation, their talents are never enough, and they end up devouring what they have been given. As we have been studying the narrative of Samson, we have seen just such an individual, a man who was self-centered, a man who was always looking out for his own interests, and he was always looking to satiate the desires of his flesh. He had no sense, it seemed, of his calling and strengthening and gifting from God. And so today, as we move through this final chapter of the Samson narrative, we'll see that while his continued self-centeredness brought about his ultimate downfall, the Lord remained fully in control and continued to use this man for his divine purposes. So will you read along with me? We're going to read the first three verses of chapter 16 to get started this morning. And I encourage you, if you're at home, you can stand uh, uh, as we read these scripture verses together. Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a prostitute And he went into her. The Gazites were told, Samson has come here. And they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night, saying, Let us wait till the light of the morning, then we will kill him. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts. And pulled them up, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the assurance we have of your steadfast love and mercy towards us that we find in its pages. Father, thank you for the truth of, of your sovereignty that we see in these pages as well. And, and Father, even when things seem completely out of control, even as we see going through the book of Judges, we know that ultimately you are the one who guides every event of human history toward the end that you have already ordained. Father, thank you for that comfort that we have in knowing you are in control. Father, as we finish this look at Samson, I pray that we continue to learn from his example, that we uh, see what you would have us to learn from this and apply to our lives so that we can be better stewards of that grace that you have so freely and generously poured out on us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, have you ever known someone who has possessed so much potential and yet because of their, uh, their serious personal flaws seem to have squandered it all? 
I think all of us probably know someone like that. We have encountered someone who just seems to have so much available to them, and yet they give it all away because they are pursuing their own self-interest. Literature is filled with examples. In fact, if you look at many of the plays of Shakespeare, you see such tragic heroes, people like Romeo, people like Hamlet, people like Macbeth. And, and these stories, they grip us so much. They, they really resonate with us. Well, Scripture provides many stories of tragic heroes as well, and I think you would be hard-pressed to find one bigger than the story of Samson. He is truly a tragic hero here in the book of Judges. And in this narrative that we see, uh, we see four different aspects of the tragedy of Samson. He's already a man that we've seen who has exhibited zero self-control. He doesn't uh, hold back if, if he, has, he has no self-discipline. He doesn't deny anything to himself. If he wants something, he never says no to himself. He never says, this is something that could be bad for me. He goes after it with everything he's got. And he's already demonstrated how strong and powerful he is. And so if he wants it, he gets it regardless of the cost. And that characteristic is perhaps nowhere, nowhere better seen than in his pursuit of women. And uh, among his many struggles that he had, Samson struggled with lust. He struggled with that physical attraction that drove him to, uh, to look on, on women as just something to appease his appetites. And once he has found the one who is right in his eyes, as he did with the Timnite woman, then he is not going to allow anything to stop him from having her. And again, we see that, first of all, with the Timnite woman back a few chapters before uh, in chapter 14. And, and he went after her. He wanted her to be his wife. And as far as Samson was concerned, she was his wife. Now, because of his actions at the end of that week-long wedding feast, his father-in-law didn't seem to think that was the case. He left in a rage. He, he was gone for some time, and he gave his daughter away to Samson's best man. But what's important for us to realize is that the Timnite woman was not a Hebrew. She was a Philistine. She was a Philistine woman, and although Philistia was not listed in that list of nations that Israel was forbidden from intermarrying with, it was still a violation of the spirit of that law. God wanted his people to be separate from the pagan nations that surrounded them, and he knew that if they intermarried with them, they would be pulled down in worshiping these false gods and idols, and so he gave that prohibition to stay away. If you remember from chapter 14, you know that Samson's parents strongly objected to him marrying the Timnite woman, and yet Samson disrespected them, and he demanded that his mother and father get her for him. Now, ultimately, she would betray his confidence, and she would meet a gruesome death at the hands of the Philistines, and it was all because of Samson's self-interest. Remember, it was because of his escalating cycles of revenge against the Philistines that she and her whole family were burned alive. But the second woman we find Samson pursuing is here in the first verse of chapter 16. It's the Gazite prostitute. And when we last encountered Samson in chapter 15, he had retreated back into the land of Judah. He had gone and, and was in the rock of Edom. And there the uh, Philistines had pursued him, again, looking to continue that cycle of revenge. And when they found him or when they were looking for him, they, they encamped in Judah. And it, it scared the Judahites. And they didn't know what was going on until the, the Philistines said, we've come for Samson. Well, they knew where Samson was. They went to him with 3,000 men, and they said to him, what have you done to us? And we'll, we'll see that in just a few moments. Now, he had retreated back into his own territory. That's a good thing, right? Samson has returned home. Maybe now he's going to lead his people, but we saw there at the end of chapter 15 
that his people didn't follow and he didn't try to lead. He did it all on his own and he did it for the purpose of appeasing his vengeance, his vengeance, not the Lord's, not anybody else. But now here at the beginning of chapter 16, we see him going back into Philistia in order to pursue another woman. At least with the Timnite woman, he wanted to marry her. This time it was just nothing but his physical desire that he wished to satisfy. And he went into a prostitute in the city of Gaza. Now it's important to know that Gaza was about 45 miles from his home and it was the southernmost of the five important Philistine cities. So in other words, he went as far into Philistia as he could to pursue this. So again, we see him pursuing a pagan woman outside of the covenant community of Israel and he's descending now into the pursuit of a woman for one purpose only, the satisfaction of his physical lust. And then the third and final woman that we see Samson pursuing is, once again, a Philistine woman from the Valley of Sorek named Delilah. Now, Samson had evaded his would-be assassins when he was there in Gaza. They were waiting for him for the morning to come out from the prostitute's house in order to uh, assault him and kill him right there in the city. But he, he gets up at midnight and he picks up the doors of the city. These weren't small doors. These weren't like the doors going out of the sanctuary or out of a house. These were massive gates, huge wood and, and iron. And the Bible says he not only ripped them up post and all, but he carried them back to the hill that was outside of Hebron, 40 miles away from Gaza. He carried these things, a feat of, of superhuman strength. But not only that, it says that it, you, if you know the territory uh, of, of Israel and, and this area, it was all uphill. He not only carried these doors on his back 40 miles, he carried them 40 miles uphill. That's not a grandpa story. That is what really happened. Amazing here. But here's Samson seeing the danger in Philistia, seeing the danger that the Philistines posed not only to him but to his nation. He returns back to his homeland and we think, okay, maybe he's got it this time. But then in verse 4, we see that he was back in Philistia in the valley of Sorek. He's returned back to them again looking for love in all the wrong places. He's really a reflection of Israel as a whole. You see, Samson is a reflection of who Israel was. Israel, who was chosen and redeemed by the one true God who loved her so much that he repeatedly redeemed her out of all of these terrible situations, out of Egypt, out of the hands of the Ammonites and the Amorites and the, uh, uh, the Edomites and everybody else who were around them. God continues to redeem them, and yet every time he redeems his chosen people, they leave him. They pursue other gods and goddesses. They are unfaithful. You see, Israel was constantly seeking what looked good in her eyes rather than the one who was actually good. Sadly, many believers today are following the example of Samson. They, they've tasted and seen that the Lord is good when they experience the grace that, that comes at salvation. They, they feel the the, the lifting of their sins and, and the freedom that they have as a new creation in Christ. And then they return to the many idols of pleasure and prosperity and prominence that, that the world offers. They keep going back over and over. And as a result, they forfeit the spiritual strength that God gives to his people just as Samson will lose his physical strength at the hands of Delilah. Now, as awful as this aspect of Samson's tragedy is, it's not the entirety of it. You see, Samson is synonymous with superhuman strength, which was given to him by God 
for the purpose of redeeming Israel, for delivering Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. But tragically, this is a fight that Samson refused. Now, that's not to say that Samson didn't fight the Philistines. He does. We've seen that numerous times in, in this uh, narrative. But every time Samson engages with the Philistines, it's for his own self-interest. It's so that he can get revenge on them for something he feels they did to him personally. Not for the honor of Yahweh, not for the honor of Yahweh's people, not for the deliverance of Yahweh's people, but for his own purposes. In fact, he didn't want to fight them. He never wanted to. Remember there after they killed his Timnite wife, he said, I'm going to get revenge on you and then I'll be done. He didn't want to fight them. In fact, he wanted to be with them. His pursuit of the Philistine women is a fine example of that. His constant forays into the land of Philistia was example of how much he wanted to be with the Philistines. He wanted to be friends with the enemies of God. Now, God had chosen Samson. God had empowered Samson. He'd situated Samson, and he sent Samson to lead Israel as a deliverer, but Samson refused to follow forth into the victory that God had already won for him. And, and every time that Samson battles the Philistines, he wins. He wins overwhelmingly. It's a huge victory there. And yet, every time Samson thinks, this will be the end of it, and I can finally have peace with the enemies of God. That's what Samson's desire in his heart was for. And when the Judahites came, and they were exasperated because of the escalating war with the Philistines, their question revealed how much they had given up. They said, do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? They were a people who were resigned to the subjection of the Philistines, the subjection of God's enemies. And they did not care that Samson had been raised up by God to lead them in overthrowing their oppressors. They were actually quite happy with the oppression. But here they had come. They'd come to the one that God had raised up. 3,000 Judahites, if God could use 300 men with Gideon to overthrow the Midianites who were as countless as the sand on the shore. How much could he do with 3,000 Judahites against the Philistines? This is an exciting moment. They've come. Samson is ready to lead them into battle, right? What's Samson's response to them when they say, what have you done to us? They started it. I'm just trying to do to them what they did to me. Y'all don't need to even get excited about this. What a tragedy of missed opportunity. And that tragedy continues to grow as we see the power that Samson lost. In verse 4, we see that sometime after he had gone into the prostitute at Gaza, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Now, we've already considered that tragedy of his pursuit of pagan women, but it's this relationship with Delilah where we see him once again give in to his greatest weakness, this, this weakness for women. And we've heard this story before, the story of Samson and Delilah, so I'm not going to belabor it, but I do want to summarize it very quickly. He falls in love with, with Delilah, and as soon as the Philistine rulers find out that they're a thing... They go to Delilah, and they bribe her with a considerable amount of silver to get her to find out what the secret of Samson's strength really is. Now, I think it's interesting that that happens in verse 5. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Seduce him and see where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, does Delilah wrestle with that decision? Does she, does she you know, say, oh, man, this guy loves me. I love him. Uh, you know, does it, no, look, right away in uh, verse 6, it goes from, we'll give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, 
Please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. The woman is not even being subtle here. She is straight out asking Samson, how can you be defeated? That is not the question that someone who loves someone would ask. You know, uh, Samson, honey, what makes you so strong and what would it take to make you be defeated? And so this begins three rounds of questioning between Delilah and Samson. And, and each time, with each question, Samson lies to Delilah. I don't think he loved her all that much either. He tells her that there are numerous things that can bind him, fresh bowstrings, new ropes, weaving his hair into a loom. If you'll do these things, that will make me like any other man, and I'll be easily defeated. Now, here's what I find interesting. After each episode, Delilah says to Samson, every time that he gets tied with the bowstrings or the new ropes or gets his hair woven into the loom, as soon as she says, Samson, the Philistines are here, he busts out, no problem. And every time she says, Samson, you've made me a fool. You've made a fool out of me. Now, that's an incredible statement because, again, she's not even being subtle. She's flat out saying, I'm trying to get you captured and defeated by the Philistines, so tell me what it is that's going to make that happen. What is it that's holding you back? And, and Samson knows this. And what this reveals to us about Samson is that he is filled with incredible hubris, a pride that is off the charts because he really believes nobody can defeat him, that he has strength beyond anything else anybody has ever had. And so he will do whatever happens. He doesn't care. And that hubris is further exemplified in the fourth round of questioning when the author of Judges says in verse 16, you can read along there, with such nagging she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. That is some strong nagging. Samson gives in and he told the truth about his Nazarite vow. Now this is interesting because up to this point, the reader of Judges isn't quite sure if Samson even is aware of his vow. If he's aware of what God has called him to do, we don't know. He just goes out and he does this thing. The Spirit of the Lord rushes upon him and he goes out and he defeats a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. He, he captures 300 foxes, sets their tails on fire and, and ties them together and puts them into the fields of the Philistines. These are all things that are happening, but nowhere do we see him recognizing or even acknowledging his uh, Nazarite vow, but here, here he does. It's not that he didn't know, it's that he didn't care. Samson doesn't care that God has chosen him. Samson doesn't care that he's been set apart by God and empowered by God. He treats his vow and his calling like everything else in his life. It's good if it benefits him and his desires, and it's something to be tossed aside if it interferes. That's why he didn't care about killing the lion and going back to the carcass and eating out of the lion the honey that the bees inside of it had made. That he, do, he doesn't care about drinking at his wedding feast, even though his Nazarite vows tell him not to be involved in things that come from the grapevine or with dead bodies. And this treatment of his vow and of his calling leads to the loss of his strength and his humiliation. The fourth time after Samson revealed the truth of his calling to Delilah to be the deliverer of Israel, his hubris led him to say, as we see in the second half of verse 20, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. And then we read the saddest words of the Samson narrative, and indeed some of the saddest words that you'll find in Scripture, but he did not know that the Lord had left him. He did not know the Lord had left him. So the Philistines rush in. He's bound. His eyes are gouged out. 
and he's taken away as a slave to be used for grinding wheat and, and grain and then later for entertainment in the Philistine temple of their pagan deity, Dagon. And this humiliation would be terrible enough, but listen again to those awful words. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Over and over, Samson had presumed upon the grace of God. He thought, it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter how I live. I can pursue whatever sinful things that I want to pursue, and God's power will always be on me. I'll always be strong. I'll always be able to overcome whoever comes at me. You see, he wanted all of the benefits of being God's called and chosen leader and judge for the people of Israel, but he wanted none of the responsibilities. He wanted none of the self-denial. He wanted none of the self-control that needed to go along with being that leader. And there are some today who treat God's grace the same way. They believe that they can pursue whatever sinfulness they want. They, they believe that whatever their heart desires, they can go after without any consequence for their action. Maybe they've never encountered serious consequence from God, at least so much as they know. And they believe that God's patience towards them is evidence of his approval of their actions. But their sinful hubris, if not repented of, will be met by God's discipline. There's no way of getting around that. We know from Scripture, if you sow the wind, you will reap the whirlwind. So brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm pleading with you this morning, if you're playing with the fire of sin, turn away from it. Learn from the example of Samson, because if you refuse to turn away from your sin, there's only one way that it will end. Now the Samson... Saga is a dire warning to believers in all ages and all places. And he's calling us to consider our ways and repent of our sinful pride because God's grace is such a precious gift and he's willing to lavish it upon us. And, and that's it. But he will not be mocked by those who take his great name and purposefully drag it through the muck of sinfulness so that their fleshly desires may be fulfilled. There will be discipline, and sometimes that discipline comes through the instruments of God's punishment that he raises up against his children. But we must not miss the fact that when God's people are humiliated because of their sinfulness, God is also humiliated. You see, the degradation of Samson in the temple of Dagon was really a degradation of Yahweh himself. Look with me in verse 23 and see how that happened. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, and the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. You see, when the Philistines called for Samson, it was ultimately so that they could not only laugh at him and degrade him, but to degrade the God Samson served. You see, the Philistines were able to uh, carry on in such a way and, and say how their God defeated the true God of the universe, Yahweh. Listen, if you're a believer this morning, you need to hear this. When you carry on in sin, you're providing a basis on which unbelievers can mock our Redeemer. I'm not talking about the, the individual sins that we commit, the, those sins that you know are a momentary lapse where we give in to temptation. Those are serious sins. I'm not downgrading those. I'm not saying that they're not sin. I'm not saying that they're not important. We need to repent of those things. But I'm talking about that pattern of sinfulness in our lives where we go over and over and over. I'm talking about the believer who believes that their conversation can just be filled with all kinds of filthy talk, whether it's you know uh, uh, inappropriate joking or, or even racist behavior and, and, and words and the degrading of other people. I'm talking about those who are... are 
well known for their knowledge of all the gossip in town. Uh, I'm talking about the Christian business owner who's known for cheating other people and, and doing shoddy work. When we're willing to personally dishonor God's holy name, we're inviting unbelievers to do the same, just as what happened with Samson. And indeed, that encouraging, uh, it's an encouraging of them to exhibit the same hubris as the Philistines did. Their taunting of both Samson and Yahweh were loud boasts of the supremacy of their false god. Their revelry revealed their relief that all they believed was true after all. You see, what it was is, it's not that Yahweh was the true god. It wasn't that Yahweh was greater than Dagon. Dagon just happened to be asleep, maybe. Or maybe he was somewhere else handling something else. But as soon as he needed to, he came and defeated the God of Samson. He defeated this Yahweh. Yahweh was weak. And, and Samson, look at how weak he is. We bound him. We gouged his eyes out. Yes, he was strong for a moment, but we were able to take care of it. And now the servant of Yahweh was blinded. He was humiliated. And he was dancing for their entertainment in the great temple of their God. You see, they thought they had blinded Samson, but really they were blinded themselves by their own hubris. And they had learned that Samson's power when, would be gone if they shaved his head. As soon as they cut his hair off, he was just like any other man, right? Their hubris, though, blinded them to something. And the author of Judges gives us a foreshadowing of what that is back in verse 22. He said, but the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. You see, even if the Philistines believed superstitiously that it was just his hair that made Samson strong, they didn't care to continue shaving his head on a regular basis. Once they had blinded him and thought they had humiliated him, then they let him alone. And so here at the end of the story, we expect to see the rise of Samson, don't we? And in some ways, he is used in a mighty way by God to strike a powerful blow against the Philistines. But as we read his prayer at the end of chapter 16, we discover that even in his humiliation, even in his defeat, Samson remains a self-centered individual. He's only caring about himself. He's only caring about his vengeance. And that prayer begins with such promise. It begins with sovereign Lord. Oh, Lord God, he, you know, oh, sovereign Lord, please remember me. That's where we're seeing here. And, and that, that's, that saying, remember me, is not, oh, God, you've forgotten me. It's God, take notice of me. Pay attention to me. And and this actually is, is what we see in the Psalms often when the psalmist writes, Oh, Lord, do not forget your servant. Oh, Lord, remember your, your children. Oh, Lord. It's not that the God has forgotten them. It is that they want him to take special notice. And he even goes on. He says, hey, Remember me. Take notice of this. But then as we continue to read through Samson's prayer, we begin to see his, his motivation. Look. When he says, please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. Not, O Lord, your honor is being besmirched by the Philistines. O Lord, they are, they are mocking you and I am filled with a righteous anger over your honor. They gouged out my eyes, Lord. Give me strength so that I can have my vengeance on them. There's nothing about Israel. There's nothing about his care for Yahweh's people or his care for the calling that, that God had put on Samson. All that matters to Samson is Samson. That's it. There's a selfishness here. You know, sometimes I wonder, and, and I know I'm guilty of this, do our prayers sound like this? Do the prayers that we lift up to God, are they self-centered? You know, when Jesus taught us how to pray in the Sermon on the Mount back in Matthew chapter 6, he says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You see, in the model prayer, it's concern for God's name, his holiness, and his will that dominates. Yes, we ask for God's provision, but that's secondary. And that's something Jesus further underscores later in Matthew 6, when he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. It's seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first God's righteousness. The other stuff will come. God will bless you with those things. But seek first his kingdom. And that's what we see in the model prayer. But look at Samson's prayer. Samson's prayer, in just a few words, has five first-person pronouns. Me, I. That's what you hear over and over in this prayer is me, me, me. Lord, look at me. Lord, consider my plight. Lord, let me have vengeance. Lord, and then go down to verse 30. Let me die with the Philistines. It's all about him. It's nothing about God. And yet, here at the end of Samson's tragic life, we still see that God will be glorified through him and through the destruction of the Philistines. Despite his selfish prayer, despite his self-centered hatred of the Philistines, despite his desire for revenge, God used Samson to bring glory to his own great name, not Samson's. You see, we've often come to this passage and we see God vindicating Samson in it. But that's not the point that the author of Judges is trying to make. God is vindicating his own name. God is vindicating his great name, not Samson's. Listen, God will not be robbed of one single ounce of the glory, honor, and praise that is due to him. But we have a choice by our words and by our actions in how we play a role in directing the praise, honor, and glory to God. And and our lives, our lives are, are, we're all called as believers to point to God's glory, that he may be glorified in all that we do and all that we say and all that we think. See, Samson's life was squandered. He was a man filled with such potential, filled with such a calling, filled with such power, It comes from the Holy Spirit, and he squandered it. When you get to the end of this, this passage here at the end of verse 30, so the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Brothers and sisters, that is not the author of Judges saying a great thing about Samson. That's actually a very tragic statement. He's saying that Samson in his death did more for God than he did ever in his life. May it not be said of us that we accomplished more for God in our death than we did in our lives. May our lives be constantly pointing to the glory of God. And what are we to make of Samson? How do we tie up this story? Well, I think the Samson saga shows us once again the amazing, mysterious choices of God. And upon closer examination, Samson isn't quite like the children's Bible stories that we read about him in the children's storybook. He is very different. And having studied Samson in greater detail, we might be surprised or even shocked by God's choice of servants. This is a man who's selfish. This is a man who's self-centered. This is a man who's vengeful. This is a man who's lustful. This is a man who does not seem to fit the mold of who we would think a servant of God should look like. This is not an Othniel. This is not a Shamgar. This is not a Gideon even. This is a man who from start to finish is only worried about himself. He has a complete disregard for his special calling and he fails to understand that the phenomenal gifts that God has given him are designed to serve others. You see, the gifts of God are not for serving ourselves. The gifts of God are to serve others. And in Samson's case, they were given to him. This great strength was given to him in order that he might serve Israel, that he might deliver Israel. 
But how did Samson use these gifts? It was always to advance his own desires. It was to create an unsolvable riddle so that he might enrich himself with 30 changes of clothing. He used his strength to make a middle-of-the-night getaway from somewhere he had no business being in the first place. He's constantly devising new and innovative ways of getting revenge against his enemies, not for any other purpose than to avail himself. At no point in Samson's story do we discover him using his gift for Israel. And yet, and yet, God used this man as his servant to bring the beginning of Israel's deliverance from under the hands of the oppressive Philistines. He starts a fight down in Ashkelon. He, uh, he's setting fire to the Philistines' crops. He's killing a thousand Philistines there at uh, Ramoth Lehi. And then, now at the temple of the god Dagon, he collapses their temple killing 3,000 Philistines at one time. God is using this man as his servant. Now, we might equally be surprised by God's use of circumstances. You know, there's times in the Samson narrative where we find ourselves squirming. We should, because it's an uncomfortable narrative. We, we find Samson doing things that we know aren't right. We find Samson being in places we know a holy man of God ought not to be. And and yet, in all of those, in the midst of these situations, God works. Despite the circumstances, God is at work. He's moving. Over and over in Samson's life, we see God working through him to destroy the enemies of God's people. Now, please, don't hear me saying God doesn't care where you put yourself. He does. I'm not telling you to go out into sinful situations, put yourself into uh, overwhelming temptation. Listen, God doesn't want you to be there, but God will still use you for glory despite your circumstances. Even so, don't let that keep you from following him where you know he wants you to be. That's what we're supposed to do. Now, the latter will always be much more blessed, a much more blessed experience for his children when you go where you know he wants you to be than going somewhere where you know he doesn't. It will always be more blessed for you. Now, finally, and perhaps most amazing of all, Samson shows us the mystery of God's choice of us. Why did he choose me? Why did he choose you? There's a mysterious aspect to this, isn't there? Samson shows us this mystery. We might be tempted to think, oh, Samson, we're, we're so unlike Samson. We're so different than Samson. And that's true. There's nobody who has the superhuman strength that Samson had at this time. And yet, we often look an awful lot like Samson, though, don't we? There's, there's nothing special about Samson. We might, we might come to Samson and think, well, God chose him because Samson was so strong. no. Samson was not strong until God chose him and gave him his spirit and the strength to do these things. God didn't choose him because of Samson's strength or Samson's usefulness to God. God chose him according to the mystery of his will and his good pleasure. Why did God choose me? I don't know. I'm thankful he did. There's nothing special about me that God would choose me. And there's nothing special about you that God would choose you. And yet he does. He did. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 2.9 said that we as believers are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Isn't it wonderful that he chose us before we chose him? John 15, 16, Jesus said to his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Every person who has been chosen in Christ Jesus did not merit that choice. God didn't choose you because he thought, wow, that's a really cool person. I want them. That's not the way that it works. He did it because of his grace. He did it because of grace that is available to you today. He did it because of grace that brings salvation. He did it because of grace that brings peace with God. He did it because of grace that calms our anxious spirits. That is amazing grace. 
And that is the grace that's available to you today. And so as you're watching at home or wherever you may be this morning or at some other point in the week, I'm going to tell you there's no greater joy than being in the Lord. That grace that he offers is, is free. It's available to you. And so if you have questions about that, I encourage you, leave a comment. We have people there who are ready and willing to tell you what it means to trust in Christ, what it means to admit and confess our sin and to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and Savior of our lives, to invite him to to save us and to surrender ourselves in faith to him. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to to set aside the self-centeredness, the selfishness that often characterizes us, to, to look at the example of Samson and say, Lord, is there anything in this example that I reflect? And if there is, to turn away from it, to repent of it, to understand that God has, has given you a tremendous calling, a calling, as Peter said, to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. What a tremendous a, a calling that every believer has. And if God has called you to proclaim his excellencies, to yell from the rooftops about his amazing grace, then I assure you he will give you the same power he gave Samson to achieve that. So will you pray with me this morning? Our gracious Father, we do thank you so much for the truth of your word. Father, you are an amazing God. Your grace is overwhelming. It's bigger than we can comprehend. It reaches every aspect of who we are. And your grace cleanses us of the sin that has separated us from you, the sin that stains us so deeply. As the prophet Isaiah said, our our garments may be crimson with sin, but you have washed us white as snow by the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for that amazing grace. We know sometimes that we are guilty of being more concerned about our own interests our own desires than we are about advancing your kingdom lord forgive us lord remind us that we are here to proclaim your excellencies and how many excellencies are there just as we said at the outset of this service father i i think of that uh, that beginning of the psalms when bless the lord O my soul and all that is within me remember his many uh, great deeds how you have forgiven us of our iniquity how you have uh, healed us of every disease how you have never let your steadfast love depart from us father what a tremendous blessing your grace is and we pray this morning for those who may not know it i know that right now there are many watching in many different places and father i know that some of them don't know you as their lord and savior They've never surrendered their life to you. And I pray right now that wherever they are, that that you would convict them by your spirit and call them to yourself. And, And Father, if they have any questions about what that means, that they would reach out. And Father, that we could show them the great grace of you so that they might Enter the kingdom adopted as a son or daughter of the king through the son, Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, we will give you all the praise, honor, and glory, not just in words, but in deed and action as well. Father, we ask this according to your will and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Final song together, um, a song about that amazing grace that, uh, that Roy was speaking of. So um, wherever you find yourself this morning, if you're still on your couch or if you're, uh, you're, you're driving, why don't you sing out with us um, this final song?
we are so glad that you have joined us this morning here at Faith Baptist Church to worship our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I would ask this morning, if you made a commitment to Christ, would you reach out to us and let us know? Uh, you can reach us via our Facebook page or our email at faith, dot, uh, faith at faithbaptistbc.org. We would love to hear that and, and tell you about the next steps of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. And we want to rejoice with you what the Lord has done in your life. Will you pray with us as we close our service? Our gracious Lord, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you that our chains are gone, that we have been freed from sin and death, that it has no dominion over us any longer. We have been transferred from the kingdom of death and darkness into the kingdom of light and life all by the work of Jesus Christ and our faith in him. Thank you, Father, that you did not require of us to do anything to earn our salvation because there's nothing we could do to earn it. But you have offered it freely through him. Father, we thank you for this, and we ask you to bless us as we go now, as we are in very uh, different times than what we are accustomed to. Father, give us patience, give us strength, give us endurance to meet the, the challenges of each day. And Father, may we always keep in front of us Jesus Christ. He is the reason for our existence. He is who holds us in his hand. And he is the one who will make sure that the work that was started in us at the moment of our salvation is completed on that day when we stand before you worshiping as one in the new heaven and the new earth. And Father, we long for that day. We ask all of this in the powerful, mighty, and saving name of Jesus Christ. Amen.